Hello, and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we talk about how to be happier. This week, we're going to talk about why we plan to observe a complaint-free month, and we are talking to superstar Matt Damon and water expert Gary White about their new book, The Worth of Water. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, and human nature. I am back in my little home office here in New York City, and joining me today from LA is my sister Elizabeth Kraft. And Elizabeth, I often complain to you, but I almost never (laughs) complain about you. Aww. (laughs) <laughs> That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in L.A. And yeah, Gretch, this uh, week's Try This at Home is going to be a challenge. Yeah, for, for sure. But we're up for it. Yeah. We're going to do it. Yes, 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 yes. And so this week, our Try This at Home suggestion is to observe a complaint-free month. Yes, and we got this idea from the writer Katherine Schultz. In episode 369, we interviewed her about her memoir, Lost and Found. And for her try this at home, she suggested giving up complaining for Lent, which is what she had done. And we were so taken with this idea, we decided we need to talk about it again and do it for the month of April. Okay, so listen. We're gearing up for this. This is going to be a big challenge. Maybe as big as our challenge of wearing clothes every day for uh, a month. Even more, <laughs> even more difficult. I even think. more difficult. So I think that we face two challenges. One is, what do we mean by complaining? And the second of is, right. how do we keep it uppermost in our minds? Because this is the kind of yes. thing where you just forget in the moment. Okay, so first of all, what do we mean by complaining? What is a complaint? I was thinking about this, like complaint. For me in LA, very typical would be complaining about traffic. Oh my God, traffic was so bad. LA is so hard, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a complaint. But I think we need to distinguish between a criticism and a complaint, a legitimate criticism, Mm. because like one of the things you say about your job as a TV showrunner is to receive criticism and to give criticism a lot of times. And so constructive criticism that's context appropriate and moving something forward is not the same thing as complaining. I always think of venting. Am I just letting off steam and saying, nobody around here does anything. I don't understand like why a simple blah, blah, blah. Or doesn't it just drive you bonkers when that to me is complaining? Yes. Well, and Sarah and I being a writing team constantly on the phone with each other, we have so much opportunity to complain (laughs) about anything. I mean, personal, professional, the world, I mean, everything. So that I'm going to have to bring Sarah, my co-host of Happier in Hollywood, into this with me because we're such a complaining team. Right. Oh, well, that'll be interesting because does she complain less? Does she complain more? Does she complain about the fact that you're not complaining? And so it kind of breaks because I do think it can be a way to bond with people. I mean, it is it, it can be negative, but it also can be something where it can be funny and people they feel like it's us against them or we all have this in common. We all have the traffic in common. We can all swap stories. It's kind of yeah. like the weather. It just gives you sort of a ground to start on. But it's a negative. Yes. It's negative. Yeah. And I do think, again, Gretch, the distinction, it's not just like, a, a you know, criticism versus complaint, a legitimate criticism, but right. it's also emotion versus complaint. I mean, you can say I feel sad or lonely yeah. or right. something Annoyed, hurt frustrated. my feelings. Yes. But I think it's the just endless complaining about just everything and everyone that we want to avoid. Yes. And so here's the second challenge, which is, okay, once we now we know what we're trying to not do, which is to complain. How are we going to keep it uppermost in our minds? Because this, I do feel like it's just so natural. I feel like complaints come yes. flying out of my it's mouth. Like breathing. I mean, I would yes. be, if we, if we could, we should try to count. How many times we have the urge to complain in a day? Because you read these statistics, like people lie 300 times a day or whatever. I just made that up. But you see these statistics and they're really staggering. And I wonder if we could try to keep count. Yeah, you need that on your Apple Watch. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Do they have the complaint thing on your Apple Watch? Complaint meter. It wouldn't surprise me. (laughs) 
Yeah, I need to write don't complain on like 10 post-it notes and have them like everywhere on my yeah. computer, on the wall, yeah. on my treadmill yeah. desk, by the coffee maker. Yeah. Thank goodness April's only 30 days. Yeah, one day short. So that's yeah. one less day that we have to do this for. I'm always in the Happier app, like doing this or that, and I'm going to put it in there. And there's a couple different tools yes. that I can use for that. And so I think that's really good because, again, that keeps it uppermost in my mind, just the way you can put a sign on your bathroom mirror because I'm always looking in the Happier app. It's a way to kind of just keep surfacing the idea because it has to be like really top of mind or else I yes. think you you just don't think of it until yes. hours later when it finally occurs to you. Oh, absolutely. Now, Gretchen, I wonder, do you think this will make us happier? Probably. This is interesting, right? I think it's going to be really interesting to see because it might make us feel frustrated and discouraged because we probably won't do a great job. We'll probably stumble a lot. And so sometimes right, right. if you don't try, you don't fail. And if you don't try to resist a temptation, you are you don't even realize that you're fighting a temptation. And so in a way, I could think that this could kind of make us feel less happy. On the other hand, it could add to our happiness by redirecting our attention towards happier things, changing the atmosphere of our relationships and our conversations. I think it's going to yes. be a really, I actually am really curious to yes, know. Yes, I am too. Well, it might make other people happier. You know, it might make other Definitely. people happier if we're, if we're not carping as much. <laughs> yes. Well, that reminds me, Gretchen, because we've done the uh, try this at home to not nag. Yes. Now, not nagging is different from not complaining. Yes. So I guess we still can nag because nagging is not complaining. We can still say it's time to get ready. Okay, five minutes. That's not right. complaining. <laughs> but there is a complaining way to nag. Which yes. is, I've asked you once, I don't want to have to yes. say it again, can't yes, you? Yes. yes. So I the think spirit. we're going to see there's nuance. Yes. Now, yes. here's the thing, Elizabeth. I think, okay, we're going to have a complaint-free month, but I think, I think we should try to think about May. Maybe we'll do a praiseful month where all we do is oh. go out of our way to praise people. That's and interesting. Articulate gratitude and praise and admiration and like really force ourselves to articulate that. So I think that will be that more fun. That feels easier, I must That say. feels easier and far more fun, but I think complaint-free will set us up for that. So let us know if you do try this at home and how giving up complaining for a month strikes you. Is this something that you want to undertake? Join us for April. Let us know. Have you ever done it in the past? Let us know on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com. Or as always, go to the show notes. This is episode 371, so you can find the show notes at happiercast.com slash 371. Coming up, we have a photo hack, but first this break. And now for this week's happiness hack, something that people often mention as a happiness stumbling block is, is photographs. How to deal with photographs, how to make the most of photographs, and our listener Betsy had a great idea. Yes, she says, in episode 367, Gretchen mentioned creating actual photo albums and handwriting captions. This idea so resonated with me and got me so excited. I have so many great photos stuck on my phone and have to scroll through them to find them. I so love the idea of creating albums. While I have lots of ideas for various albums, the most important is an album of my kids. I asked them each to send me six of their favorite photos, primarily of them, but could include others or activities. This way, I knew they would send pictures they liked, but also I could learn something about them. They immediately responded with some questions, but after years of being photo resistant, embraced the idea. I cannot wait to start creating these albums to have physical access to some of the most fun, important, and meaningful times and people in my life. Thanks for this great idea. The idea that really caught my attention was this idea of asking other people to submit their entries, because I think this yes. is really fun, because when I make photo albums, I'm taking them off my collection, and I will say to people, oh, send me your photos from this vacation or whatever, and I try to create a complete set. But I think it's a fantastic idea, maybe for a minor family anniversary or something. And everybody submitted their own choices because they'd have different photographs yes. and they'd also have different ideas about what they valued or what they wanted to memorialize. Yes. And that way, you know, you'll have pictures, hopefully like of Betsy, 
Because in Betsy's picture, she's probably not in any of them. Yes, exactly. And like she says, maybe people are more cooperative if they have chosen the photographs themselves. Yes, yes, yes. So great hack. Yes, we always need more photo hacks. And now it's time for an interview. We are doing a double interview this time. And oh my goodness, we are talking to Matt Damon. Yes, Matt Damon and Gary White. Matt Damon is the Oscar-winning actor, producer, and screenwriter known for starring roles in movies like Born Identity, Goodwill Hunting, Saving Private Ryan, The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Martian, The Departed, Ocean's Eleven, Contagion, and Stillwater. Gary White is the internationally recognized water and sanitation leader and expert who has received numerous awards and honors. For instance, he made Time's list of the 100 most influential people. Together, these two have co-founded two nonprofits, Water.org and Water Equity, to address the global water and sanitation crisis. They've just written a new book, The Worth of Water, Our Story of Chasing Solutions to the World's Greatest Challenge. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hey, it's great to talk to you. Now, on this podcast, we talk about how to create happier lives, and one way to be happier is to put your values into action in the world, and that is what your terrific book is about. Um, And people who tackle big problems often talk about experiencing a moment of obligation when they realize, you know, here is a big problem and I need to be the one to tackle it. And each of you in the book talk about your moment of obligation with water, uh, wash, right? Uh, water sanitation, hygiene. I love that uh, that abbreviation. Um, so maybe could each of you explain your moment of obligation? Well, I can go first if that's all right. Um, I'm, I think my moment of obligation was being confronted with the water and sanitation crisis for the first time when I was actually an undergraduate in university and then uh, also knowing that I was drawn toward engineering. And to me, that speaks to the moment of obligation, right? Here is a massive problem uh, that the world's facing. And here is, you know, I'm being formed into an engineer, ostensibly the type of person who could address this. That obviously spoke to a moment of obligation. And what I would call, you know, finding the intersection, maybe flipping it the other way beyond obligation, but it's a pursuit of of seeking the intersection between the world's greatest need and your greatest passion. And to me, that was the moment that uh, really determined the course of my life. Well, Gary, we have to point out you're from Kansas City, Missouri, and we're from Kansas City, Missouri. So we got a big kick out of reading about Kansas City in your book. (laughs) Go KC. Yes. Yeah, go KC. Now, how how about you, Matt? Well, how did you get connected to the issue of water? Well, I was studying about all these different issues of of extreme poverty and kind of where and how they intersect. And I just was was floored by the extent to which water underpinned everything. And um, and the, the first kind of personal experience that I had with it was going on a water collection with a girl and and ha- striking up a conversation with her and really connecting to her around her hopes and dreams of like what she was going to do in the future. She was we were in rural Zambia and she was she was she had these dreams of becoming a nurse and moving to the big city of Lusaka and I just remembered that I knew that feeling of being 14 and going like I'm going to move to the big city of New York. I'm going to be an actor and the way Ben and I kind of pursued that and that so much of that age is about all of the potential that your life might be and all of these dreams. And, and it wasn't until I drove away that I realized, you know, had, had it not been for somebody putting a well near her, her, where she lived, this kid wouldn't even have been in school. She would have been collecting water and spending her entire day doing that as so many women and girls do. I mean, it's an, it's a, it's an issue that disproportionately affects women and girls and there are millions of girls who just aren't in school because they're 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 looking for water and spending millions of hours every day that they that they could be you know learning something and 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 planning for for kind of a great life and all their potential and they're not they're just they're just trying to find water so that their family can survive to the next day and and so that was a real kind of epiphany for me and and um, you know because there 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 are two sides to it there's the there's the the meaningless and just tragic death that occurs, right? We're going to lose 300,000 children this year under the age of five to things that are totally preventable, um, you know, because they lack access to water and sanitation. Um, So that's just, you know, brutal and unconscionable. 
And on the other side, you have all of the opportunity costs, like what do we lose by the, these, these girls not being able to live to their potential? Um, you know, and so, and so that, that just kind of, that, this was about 15 years ago, and that's really what kind of lit a fire under me. And then you each had your moment of deciding to focus on this, and then you had a meet cute, um, as you call it in the book. <laughs> Can you describe that moment? Yeah, it didn't feel like it was out of a romantic comedy, actually. <laughs> it, was, it was probably more awkward than that, you know? The, the kind of a, a corporate training video, totally, more or totally, less. Yeah. It did make it quotable. You're quoting it, so that, it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we met for the first time in person at the Clinton Global Initiative, um, which was, and, and, and President Clinton's been really helpful for us th th over the years. Um, he looked at our model... 10 years ago, before we'd even reached a million people, and he really got it, and he said, this this is gonna work, you guys, this is really, you know, you just keep running the numbers up, keep, you know, it's gonna become undeniable. Um, and uh, because it was becoming clear that these loans were paying back at 99% and above, you know, these loans we were get, that we were facilitating to the, um, to some of the poorest women on, on the planet and they were, and they were paying them back, you know, at an alarmingly high rate, and mm -hmm. that just kind of proved our philosophy, which was just that, 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 you know, it was about empowerment and it was about just, just nudging a market towards these, these borrowers and then getting out of their way and letting them solve their own problem and take control of their own lives. And so, um, so, so yeah, so, th but, but this was all just a theory when, when I met Gary, um, in 2000, was it eight? 2000? 2008. Yeah, yeah. 2008. When we, when we first met in person at, at CGI. Well, you write about how you really, um, your organizations are aimed at building and scaling market-based financial solutions. So in very simple language, explain why you think it's important to take that approach rather than other approaches that pe that people have used. Well, I, I can start, but I think it's, it's recognizing that while philanthropy is extremely powerful and we need philanthropy to kind of fuel our work to get this done, it also has its limitations. And when you look at this as a $1 trillion problem to get water and sanitation yeah. to everyone in the world, you have to look for uh, other means to kind of you know, lean into the problem. And so what we discovered is that we can use philanthropy to go out and kind of create these models around water credit to get lenders to come to the table to, you know, we help use that money to take on risk so that they will make these loans to, you know, poor households. And the reason it can work is because women are already paying huge amounts of money and time to get water every day. Yeah. Sometimes going for hours every day to wait in line for water at a, at a public uh, water point, to walk to a water hole, or they're paying cash. Sometimes they're paying up to 25% of their income to buy water from these vendors who come around and sell it you know, off the back of a truck. And so what we discovered is that, that women would actually go out and take out loans from loan sharks at 125% interest sometimes so they could get a water connection mm -hmm or build a toilet. And for us, it's like, okay, maybe this problem contains its own solution. What if we could nudge the microfinance market towards water and sanitation, which they wouldn't touch because they saw it as too risky, we could de-risk it for them. They would make these loans and then the women would buy their time back if they were walking for water and go work at a paying job. Girls who were walking would go to school. You know, the money that they were spending on the water supply could then be redirected to other things. So we experimented and it worked. You know, you fast forward 43.7 million people now have got access to water through mm -hmm. water credit loans. And we've been able to bring more than $3.5 billion of additional loan capital into this for these loans. And so that's what we talk about as being social entrepreneurs and trying to find new solutions uh, to old problems vexing problems like this one of water and sanitation. Well, one of the things that was that I found interesting in the book is you talked about like initially no one was interested in water. And then and then it sort of became a cause that many people were interested in and that was very exciting. But then the world kind of moved on in a way that you hadn't expected and that now you're thinking about how to use humor and how to how to recapture people's attention. Um, what has that been like to sort of experience that that shift over time? Um, which maybe you don't think about it unless you're caught up in it. Yeah, I mean that's been a real subject of conversation for us, a constant one for for years now. 
because it's an issue that compared to others is less relatable. If you're somebody who has access yeah. to water, right? Like the way mm -hmm. I grew up, I, there was always a kitchen sink. There was a bathroom sink. There was, there was accessible water in abundance all around me. Um, and, and so unlike other issues like AIDS or cancer or other things that people get involved with where, where we have a family member who, uh, you know, was ill or we, right. or, you know what I mean? We can, we, there's a one-to-one -one relation that, mm -hmm. that, and so that's kind of the first hurdle that we have to clear around water and sanitation is just trying to help bring people along to understand that when this is a problem for you, as it is for, you know, in the case of safe, clean water, it's 770 million people. Um, that's the first thing they're thinking about in, in, in the, in the morning. It, it's one of the reasons actually we call the book, the, the worth of water that's based on, there's a Benjamin Franklin quote where he says, you know, uh, when the well runs dry, we know the worth of water. And, yeah. and so the people th that we're writing about the real, the, the people who are at the center of this story, um, are those people who really understand the worth of water and they have something to teach us about it. Yeah. Well, there's some staggering statistics. 66 gallons of water is for a family of four for how long? Like a week, a day? Yes. I mean, it was, it, it was, you don't realize how much water you need yeah. if you don't, if you don't have to think about oh, it. Oh yeah. Per, per capita, it's more than a hundred gallons a day uh, that, wow. are, that, that we, we use when you look at all of, all of the things that we do in our household and, and products that we purchase. So it's staggering. Right. And right. you both write a lot about failures, things that didn't work as you were on this water journey. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's inspiring to hear that it just doesn't, you know, the <laughs> success doesn't just come right away. Oh, it sure doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some of ours that have failed and it's always a constant. It's very humbling, but but I think, you know, one of the things we want to encourage people to do in the book is, is not to have that be a barrier to entry for them, right? It's, it's, you're going to make mistakes. It's all about iterating and getting better at what you're doing and, and, uh, and learning and, and, and evolving. And so, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's definitely, we were definitely humbled at times, but, um, but uh, what, what, what seems to have, you know, what's happened now is just that it, it's, it's, it's really by and large a success story. Um, but no, we definitely fell on our face getting there. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it is a challenge. It, you know, some of these failures uh, that have happened across the board with lots of NGOs is is doing these projects for people instead of with them, yes. right? And yeah. and that's the the whole concept of of water credit. It's empowering women to make the decision for water and sanitation that's best for them. It might be a public tap. It might be a certain type of toilet that they want. It might be a water filter. It might be a water tank. And so what we're doing is really trying to unleash their potential with this slight nudge of a loan so that they can go and get what's best for them. And once you invest in it, instead of it being a gift, you're going to maintain it. You are going to take care of it. You wouldn't take out that loan unless you really valued what you're, what you're going to get for your family uh, and the impact. And to us, the story of our, in our, you know, in our book is the story of getting these insights for our innovation from the very people that mm -hmm. we are trying to to reach out to i mean you know talking to that woman in india who went to the loan shark and paid 125 percent interest for a loan that's an insight that then sparks our journey so that we can get past the failures and find success in the the wisdom that they actually bring to us well, in The Worth of Water, you make such a compelling case for why water really is at the heart of so many things, of climate change, education, equality. Um, and, and you really make yeah. a case for why your approach is really proven. You've, you've tried, you failed, you tried again. So yeah. if an individual wants to get involved, they want to help with the issue of water, what, what do you say, where, what's a good place to start? Well, they can buy the book if they want. Uh, all, of, mm -hmm. all of our <laughs> proceeds uh, go to uh, right back into... Uh, water.org. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's w one of the reasons we wrote it was uh, it was a, it was a good way to to uh, to fundraise. But what was more important was getting the word out. If we can get that word out. So if you if you if you 
buy the book and you're interested, bring it to your book club, you know, or give it to a friend, right? And, you know, be a, be an ambassador, for, for, you know. It really is a fun read. It's funny to say that about a yes. policy question about yeah. something that's like threatening humanity, but it was, it really yeah. is. I could imagine reading it in a book club. It really is. Yeah. We, we wanted it to feel like, like you, like you were in the back of a Jeep with us in yes. India and we were just yeah. having kind of a freewheeling conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, a, you, it really yeah. captured that. Um, well, I gave this morning, so you got, you got, ah, uh, you know, you got you. One, one convert. Yes. Um, so the last <laughs> thing before we let you go, uh, we always ask our guests, do you have one try this at home suggestion for people, something concrete, realistic they can do in their own life to be happier, healthier, more productive, or more creative? Do you, what would you suggest? Well, I, I, far be it for me to give advice to anybody. I'm, I, I, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> but, but here's one somebody gave me recently that I, that I like, uh, and it's very simple. If you're, if you're in the shower in the morning, mm. turn the water cold. Ah. Try just for like a minute. And it actually, it, it, it wakes you up. It's better than a cup of coffee. And yeah, it's, it's hard, but if you just do it, 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 it helps kind of increase blood flow. It's a good wake up and it's, it's actually a good way to set your day in motion. And it'll make you take a shorter shower begin, which will save, save water. water. Win, win. Ooh, yeah. well, well done. Well played. It all comes together. <laughs> how about you? Yeah. How about you, Gary? Well, I think it, it, it's not surprising a water theme. I think, you know, you know, meditating in the morning, I like to do that. But then I also, you know, meditate on, on the water, right? So I would say, you know, even after your meditation, mm -hmm. just, you know, taking a pause that, that day, when you take that first drink of water, or turn the tap on, just to recognize what a miracle that is. And we, because it literally is a miracle when we help yes. these women who literally overnight go from maybe walking hours each day to that tap gets installed at their house the next morning and they turn it on. And it is a miracle for them. I've seen women in India who built altars and let, let incense around the water faucet and put flowers around it wow. almost like it's a shrine because that, wow. that reflection on what, for us is so mundane and for them is literally mm. a whole new lease on life. And I think the, you know, a little calling to mind each day, what the miracle is that that faucet is there for us. Well, that is a beautiful transcendent idea to okay. end on. We should feel so grateful every time we turn on our water and get that safe water and to try to make it available to everyone. So thanks so much, Gary and Matt. We're so glad we got the chance to talk to you. Thanks, no, thanks Thank for you. having us. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, we had a photo hack this week. Coming up, Gretchen gives herself a photo demerit, but first this break. Okay, Gretchen, we are back with demerits and gold stars, and this week you are up for a demerit. Yes, as you said, speaking of photographs, this is a photo-related one. We recently went on spring break to Mexico, and I just didn't take enough photographs. I mean, mm. and I told myself that I would, and I took some, but I didn't take enough, and I didn't take enough of a variety. And I asked Eliza and Eleanor to send photographs, but the problem with Eliza and Eleanor is they will take 100 photographs of themselves doing one thing so that they can right. absolutely pick the the most flattering one. But it's like, that's only one photo for me yeah. because I'm not interested in every iteration of this or that. Now I'm like, oh, I, I wish I had taken a picture of this situation or why didn't, you know, I often am in the moment. I'm like, I want to enjoy the moment. I don't want to bother to pick up yes. my phone. But I think that often it really wouldn't have taken away. And research shows that it really does not take away from someone's experience if they take a photo. Often it can kind of deepen their appreciation of a moment. Like we went on this hike. I could have just snapped a quick photo to just set the scene. Mm -hmm. And because I worry that later I won't remember it. I use photo albums as a way to prompt memories. I'm always worried about like not remembering my own life. So yes. photographs play that really important role for me as kind of triggering I remember that hike. And so I feel like it would make me happier if I had a more complete set of photographs. It's funny, Gretchen, because I actually noticed you weren't sending as many vacation photos as usual. So yeah. I, it's funny. I did track that. Oh, that's moment. interesting. I should have said, Gretchen, send yeah. photos, and then you would have <laughs> taken more photos. That's right. That's right. Okay. But I'll do better next time. Demerit, benefit. Um, Elizabeth, what is your gold star? 
Okay, Gretch, I am giving a gold star to myself and to Adam Yay. because Good. we went to our first dog training class Yay. last week. So we have, Adam did do another session with a dog trainer, but this is a class. It's like six weeks. We go to the pet supply store where they have the class and we take the dog and there's other people in the class, which is good because, you know, it'll help the dogs learn how to deal with other dogs. Yeah. So I must say we're quite intimidated by the whole thing, but I am proud of ourselves for finally taking the leap and doing it. So I will report back about how it goes. It'll be fun. Well, one of the things that I learned from dog training is the do the training is for the people. The dogs are never right, the issue exactly. the people. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I should say Adam and I are going, I should say Daisy and Nacho are taking Adam and me to dog training class, <laughs> yeah, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. Excellent. I can't wait to hear about the adventures. Yes. The resources for this week, as I mentioned, it's the 16th anniversary of my blog. So if you want to sign up to get those posts by email, another way that you can get to it is by happiercast.com slash blog updates. That's easier to remember. Or of course, I'll put the links in the show notes. Also, um, it's spring cleaning time for a lot of people. And if clutter clearing is on your to-do list, I am doing a dust clearing bingo on Fridays. You can use bingo cards to gamify this task to make it more fun. So if you go to Twitter or Instagram, I'm at, at Gretchen Rubin. You can play along and gold stars if you join me in this clutter clearing <laughs> endeavor. Um, and Elizabeth, what are we reading? What are you reading? I am still listening to Eric Schwartzel's book, The Red Carpet. How about you? Well, I have to say that I just stopped reading something. That's one Ooh. of my reading yes. things is that if I don't like a book, I can stop reading it. It's a book that many people have enjoyed. It's quite popular. It's not for me. I'm stopping reading it. But as a writer, I will never publicly disagree. Like, you right. know, I don't want to say anything about somebody else's book. So I'm not going to say the title, but now I have now I can pick up a book that I'm excited about. So now I just have to pick All what right. I'm going to read next. Yay. And that is it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home. Observe a complaint-free month. Let us know if you're joining us and how it's working for you. Thank you to our terrific guests, Matt Damon and Gary White. Read their book, The Worth of Water. Thanks to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Cadence 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Twitter, at Gretchen Rubin, and I'm at Elizabeth Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And if you like the show, it's a huge help to our show if you will rate, review, and follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Kraft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us. Onward and upward. So, Elizabeth, how bonkers was it to talk to Matt Damon? <laughs> I know. And, of course, he was so nice. He was so charming. I would have expected nothing else. But it, it is always nice, though, to see that somebody lives up to their reputation. Yes. From the Onward Project.